All right. Hello, this is the Guide Conclusion Podcast, and I'm your host, John Leonard. Um, today, we're going to start with our first guest is going to be Kyle Lloyd. Kyle and I have been friends on social media. Uh, I'm going to sandbag you real quick, Kyle, and ask you, do you know how long it's been? Oh, man. Uh I think it's almost been eight years now, actually. It's been nine. It's nine? June June of 2014. Wow. And wow. I, th- I think it's a testimony to your patience that <laughs> uh, I haven't alienated you in all that time. Um, so, Kyle, um, well, The Guy Conclusion is a book that I wrote, and I started a Facebook page to promote the book, and Kyle did not realize it was me and started coming in and making comments on the page. And one thing led to another. He invited uh, another gentleman by the name of Aaron Ra onto the um, Facebook page. And Aaron invited me into a show. And then I said, hey, I can do podcasting. So here we are with my very first show. And Kyle's going to begin by telling us his his views on i believe macro evolution so kyle i'll pass the baton to you sure yeah um well the i kind of wanted to talk about your book a bit too uh, i think the Absolutely. last time yeah which is the last time we talked um you know basically we kind of talked about um okay well let's let's start over so what i want to first talk about is what evolution is not because a lot of the people that i talk to on your page they get the very un- misunderstanding of evolution the most common things i hear are evolution is one thing giving birth to another a uh, dog giving birth to a cat uh you know they they have these misconceptions of what evolution really is so i want to start off with explaining what evolution is not and that is that it is not one thing coming from a completely other thing. It's a process that involves uh, populations. It's a period of time. It's not instantaneous. It's not a rabbit gro- wishing it could grow wings. It's not a crocoduck. It's t- it's you know. But it takes time and process for it. And here again, I want to specify that I have no credentials in this. This is an understanding that I have done as a layman on my own time. Um, But I think from my years of talking to other uh, either ID proponents, which is pretty much what John's book is about, is ID um and from what i understand is it's mostly misconceptions on what not john in particular but people that i've talked to about evolution um the first thing that john talk, mainly his book talks about is the improbability uh the premise one for usually the improbability was life was either created by god or random chance the premise too is the probability of life emerging by random chance is extremely unlikely conclusion therefore life must have been created by god but this is committing two logical fallacies in the fact that it's a black and white logical fallacy meaning that you're only giving two chance two opportunity or not two opportunities two um two options that could only be the outcome you know that's like saying um well the pyramids could have only either been created by aliens or a tornado well we know that you know tornadoes don't create pyramids so therefore it's aliens because the egyptians they they couldn't create that technology so i think when you break down the probability argument because you can talk about dice too when you're rolling at one dice what's the probability of rolling a one through six you know one to the sixth power you know what's 
the probability of rolling two sixes, two to the six power, so on and so forth, the, the larger you get. But arbitrarily assigning probability to something doesn't make it more unlikely because rolling eight sixes is just as likely as rolling eight of, of different numbers on the side of dice. <clears throat> So I think that's something that John and I will definitely talk about. Um, but also, the biggest thing is you push it back to God being the ultimate Boeing 747 in the end. Because you, you say, well, everything has to have a creator, but except for God. So you have the special pleading, but God is the ultimate Boeing 747. He is the ultimate complexity, the ultimate all-knowing being. So in the end, you're just in the, you're just pushing it back. And this is why I've had problems with the improbability fallacy and in God in general. And I'm I guess I consider myself an agnostic. Um, atheist where you know i'm open to there being a god i'm not so much you know thinking of a christian god maybe there's something like spinoza's god where universe is is god and you know we worship nature as a whole um but also another thing i've heard john talk about is irreducible complexity not i don't think john uses the irreducible complexity as stephen meyer does He's explained it to me about cells being irreducible complex. And my understanding about cells is that they break down into very basic, um, very basic proteins and amino acids that can be shown to just have um, properties that do it. So it's not chance, it's just the, what these certain chemicals do. They bond, they form, and and different environments they tend to um you know they they show that they have physical properties that combine them and do what cells do um in particular with irreducible complexity it was actually id was challenged in the courtrooms there was a famous case called kitz miller versus dover where it, id was actually challenged in uh, I believe it was in one of the Carolinas. I can't remember which one in general. It was a big court case, took to the Supreme Delaware. Court. Delaware. Uh, and, and they took it to the Supreme Court. And the judge was a Bush-appointed judge. And Bush was known for saying that teach the controversy. This was something that he was known for wanting at the time. But in the court case, the proponents for ID... The people who ended up showing up was two people was was uh, Stephen Meyer and the guy who produces uh, irreducible complexity. Um, Michael Behe. Michael Behe. And on the stand, Michael Behe was shown several books on on how uh, cells and, um, you know, he basically got shown, you know, said, oh, well, this isn't possible. Uh, his main argument was that if you break down, um, what is it, John? The uh, um, uh, the things with the little syringe needles, the little micro cells. Uh, Michael Teeples? No. Oh man. Um, here I can probably Google this real quick. I meant to write this down. Oh, the um, bacterial um, the flagellum. No, bacterial flagellum. Basically, he said that if you remove certain components of a bacterial flagellum, that they they become unusable. Which what proved which was he was shown several instances of that not being the case. And the famous mouse trap thing is showing that yeah, you can remove a component of a mouse trap. It doesn't become a mouse trap anymore but it still has other functions that it can do. And that's the whole point. And just because you remove a portion of a cell or uh, of a flagellum doesn't mean that they become useless. It just means they become used for a different function. Um, 
Let me get my notes back up here. I'm almost done here. Um, so basically, kind of, I want to wrap up with this, and I hope I didn't go over the place. This is my first podcast and speaking publicly. No, you uh, were invited to speak it, yeah. it, as long as you wanted to start the show to express your point of view, and, and that's what we're doing. Okay, um, so I'd like to end it with this. So if, evolu if evolution didn't happen, and that's fine, let's say evolution is false. Does that mean that creation or idea is true? No, because we just need to know what function. If there is an evolution, how did it happen? I'd really like to, for us to talk about that. How did the species become the species we said that we are today. I don't know if you subscribe to the Noah Ark, but was there a proto species? Was there a proto dog that after it got off the ark, all dogs just evolved from that wolf and we were down to the dogs you see today? Was there a single bird? Then we just evolved from the bird. Did where did those birds come from? Whereas did they just God say abracadabra and boom, there was a bird and boom, there was a dog and boom, there was humans. What is the what is what are you um, proposing and how can we test that? Um, I'd well, also like to say that almost done. And then one last thing I'd like to say that uh, evolution doesn't mean there is no God. There are lots of Christians and many people of faith who accept evolution and, you know, are still very much Christian. And I just want, you know, people to know that. There's a lot of stuff out there that says evolution is against God, and I just don't think that's true. I'm not the best person to talk about that with, but there are plenty of Christians who do accept evolution that explain their theological. And now I'm done. Thank you. Um, and I would like to begin by conceding, yes, there are quite a few Christians today that uh, ascribe to the theory of evolution, and I'm not one of them. I make no bones about that. And I have reasons that are based in logic that I'd like to share with you in the rest of this conversation. Um, and, and maybe it's the difference where I'm coming at this from an information technology background where there really is no room for gray area. Um, it's a binary world. It's either a zero or a one. And when <clears throat> when you say that the universe was uh it, it had an origin we know that that we call it the big bang yeah john and, i don't mean to interrupt uh is this a conversation or do you want me to let you say your piece and then then we jump in i'm just curious uh well if you want to use that little raise hand uh button that we talked oh, right. about earlier, um, right. then, then i will come to a stopping point quicker than I might necessarily. Okay. But, I just don't, uh, yes, I don't in the course of this, I want to do a, a conduct a, a thought experiment where we yep. talk about the, how one species might evolve from another, because I've given this a fair amount of thought, but getting back to my point, if we start with the beginning, which is that the universe had an origin there is one way to look at it where the choices are binary in nature. The universe was either planned or it was unplanned. And if it was unplanned, then we can say that chance or probability played a significant role in the formation of the universe and the origin of life. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would agree that uh, for improbability, you know, just by, I mean, what do you mean by improbability that like, it just, well, when I say like, a roll, like you're talking about like a roll of a dice kind of improbability, when, when, I, when I say oh, probability is chance. So when you talk about probability, you have to talk about rolling dice and um, fair cards and you know, decks of cards and things like that, because well, there is an element of chance that if you pull a card from a deck, it's not going to necessarily be the ace of spades. It could be the two of diamonds. Right. If if you roll a dice, you could get anywhere from a one to a six. 
And so there is probability associated with the origin of the universe. And that was calculated. These are not my numbers. This is the calculations of uh, Sir Martin Rees did the, uh, the, the foundational work on what would be required to have our, this particular universe, this anthropic universe, to form by chance. And he came up with these six cosmological factors. And then Sir Roger Penrose came along after him and applied um, some sort of math mathematical calculations to determine that the probability of the Big Bang is something on the order of one in 10 to the 300th power. Which, you know, if you're talking about rolling dice or betting on games or something like that, if you're talking about a 1% probability, you're talking about a very low chance. And we're talking about something that is infinitesimally low in, in comparison to even the single percentage point. Right. One but in 10 to the 300th power. But oh, well, let, 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 me, let me please finish oh, sure. my, my, my thought train here. Um, the probabilities get worse as we progress through time from the origin of the universe to our existence, we have immediately after the Big Bang, we have cosmic inflation, which is not, it's tied to the Big Bang, but it happens immediately afterward, where space stretches at a much faster rate than it is currently expanding today. And that, calculations was also done by Sir Roger Penrose and he calculated that the number was somewhere in the order of one in 10 in 10 to the 124th power. And I don't even know how to write that number. It's so ridiculously low. So that's two very extraordinary improbabilities that are stacked on top of each other and you have don't even have life yet. You've only got a universe capable of supporting life. And then when you get into the origin of life, the calculations on the formation of a single protein, I don't want to try to quote numbers. I was watching a video on it earlier today, but they were trying to put it in, you know, some context where it's an amoeba crossing the universe and it can cross the universe with every atom in the universe a hundred thousand times or something ridiculous before a living cell can be formed because it is that improbable that all of the ingredients of a cell and the, uh, the minimum cell today that is estimated that it's got a minimum of 300 proteins and just the formation of one protein is, produces yet another astronomical improbability. So, in the unplanned universe, you've got all of these improbabilities that keep getting worse and worse as you head from the origin of the universe to your existence. Whereas in the planned universe, where God the creator speaks the universe into existence, I mean, the stories that, are, that describe God are fantastic. They're very hard to believe. I concede that, and I see that you want to speak, so I'm going to shut up now and and give you the opportunity. Um, yeah, I think um, I think what you're forgetting though is that these, for, you know, these things have properties to them that they they do stuff. You know, like when you're talking about like proteins forming. I mean, the Yuri Miller showed that proteins can form in mundane. Uh, scenarios that it doesn't uh, uh, take such com complexity to to have proteins and that these things are the building blocks for them are everywhere that's just you know and then at, when you're talking about the, the the beginning of the universe um during the expansion i mean there wasn't even photons up until um you know i think it's like two hundred thousand years after the initial uh, expansion. Um, so all the the more heavier elements that weren't produced until stars were formed and then supernovas and all that stuff. So I think 
that these things just have these properties that just it's not necessarily probability it's just what they do anyway go ahead uh well you mentioned miller yuri and and i would like to um offer that it didn't actually um create proteins or nucleotides or anything like that it was only amino acids mm -hmm. and the experiment that Miller Urey conducted could be described as an act of intelligent design because they did conceive of this experiment. They put the ingredients in a carefully controlled environment and they produced a result. That to me is the, it, the, it, it's taking the intelligence out of creation. Well, I think I think they're only just trying to show that in, in even mundane conditions that it can do it. They're just giving scenario. They're just simulating scenarios to do it. Um, now, I'm not aware if they've done anything. I'm sure they have done more tests since then. I'm not aware of what they are, but um, I mean, I think, like I said, they were just trying. I get what you're saying about, you know, hey, these guys, there's, they put intelligence behind it. They just, they built a lab and experiment. So, I mean, right, this is how they got, you know, they, by that, they put intelligence behind it. But what they were just trying to show that even in the most mundane scenarios in early life, these could have happened because I think they had like lightning or like electricity zapping it. They had, I can't remember at the top of my head what they put in there uh, to do it with. But then, yeah, I mean, they just set up scenarios of a, a scenario of early, early life on the planet and just showed that, hey, this is a possibility. This, And that's another thing that a lot of uh, creationists get wrong is they thought that the Yuri Miller was trying to prove life from non-life when it, that's not what they're trying to do at all. It, it, in a way, and you're right. Technically, they were not trying to create the first atom, or excuse me, the first living cell, but they were trying to show the process of non-organic chemicals to becoming organic chemicals. And to some degree, they did do that. And, and I will be the first to admit, my position is not one that is um, immune to criticism because it, it, it does rely on faith. I mean, I am a Christian, and so my beliefs are based on faith. But I'm coming at this from the perspective of trying to use scientific evidence and logic, which is my strong suit. It, it was my career um, for the longest time in, in, uh, in computer programming. So <clears throat> I'm trying to, to take a logical approach to this and still seek the truth, knowing that I've got confirmation bias, knowing that um, I'm going to be looking to, to interpret information in a way that's favorable to my worldview, just as you're doing the same thing. But I've got a pretty compelling argument for a planned universe and intelligence, because what you're arguing is that intelligence emerged from non-intelligent origins, that simple chemical and physical processes that have no intellect, no thought behind them whatsoever, could lead to the formation of any type of animal, much less a human being. Uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I want to push back a little bit on the the faith thing because it's not like I'm like jumping for joy that we are like primates and that we're that evolution is true. It's not like that something that because I've I tried many times to to be a Christian. I looked. Uh, you know, I wanted to look at the Bible, many other religions, too. I, I was, you know, having, you know, a conflict of faith in my late teens and early, early 20s. I was, 
having a hard time in my life. I wanted, I thought that becoming a Christian would be a great way to help me, uh, you know, better my life. Uh, it's got, you know, some rules. So it's not like I'm like, want evolution to be true. It's just that the what the evidence that I've been shown is just seems overwhelming the that you know we're a you know we're apes and that we're descendant that you know we have common ancestry between chimps and uh, other apes and that there used to be you know several species of humans at one point but for one reason or another we kill either humans killed them off or they just became extinct and um, you know, I think that when you get down to the real tribalistic part of humans, you can see a lot of similarities between us and apes, and not just in, in homology, but the tool usage. Like, when you get down to, you know, the the primitive man, you know, when they're using spears and, you know, uh, all that, and, you know, even apes use tools. There, there's very few other species that use tools the way primates do. There's tool sets that even other, you know, chimps keep to get to get their food. And they're one of the only animals that do that. Um, and like I said, this isn't something that I'm like jumping for joy about. I would love to ha have a creator of a God that, you know, answers my prayers and, you know, the comfort of knowing that I'm constantly loved by Christ. And, it's very appealing. It's a very appealing thought to me. But, you know, I try, you know, with the more I questioned, you know, the the Bible, I mean, we don't have to talk about the Bible itself or anything, but, you know, the more I looked into the Bible, the research, the historicity of it, and it just, it just to me became more of a everyday book than an actual book written by God, just as the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or um, whatever all the other more book of mormon uh you know so i guess that that's why I, I don't want to think i'm coming at this with faith per se i'm just trying to look if there was a, a piece of evidence that i could find that would really show that was like overturned evolution i would change my mind right now and say okay evolution is false but i just haven't seen that that evidence yet well, I would beg to differ. I would say that you do believe in evolution based on faith because you're looking at evidence or what has been interpreted and presented to be evidence that humans evolved from apes. And, and I don't want to lose track and, and go on too long. I want to try to do this thought experiment. That I'm we, ready to do it whenever you want. Um, Fair enough. Um, well, let me go ahead and start now. Okay. All right. The, the belief is that humans evolved from an ape ancestor. But if you look at that document that I um, sent to you in our chat, um, it talks about that the human chromosome 2 was actually formed by chimp chromosomes 12 and 13 fusing together okay okay yeah I'm, following. I'm reading looking at it right now all right so if they're chimp chromosomes then we should be descended from chimps not a chimp ancestor correct no uh, no no it's it's saying that we sh us and chimps share that that fusion that's part of the the reason chimps don't have the fusion only humans have that fusion. Oh, let me read this for And just for I'm record, reading this part this is, that, I mean, this I'm, is the beginning, but it says sequent blocks that closely flank the inverted arrays of degenerate telomere repeats, making the fusion sites are duplicated at many primarily sublomer, sublomeric locations. In addition, large portions of 168 
KB central mirror proximal blocks are duplicated. Uh, something, I don't know what those numbers are with the 98% to 99% average sequence of identity. So isn't that saying that we're sharing of, of identity with the, the chimps there? It says humans have what four say, what, what that, that What that um, paper is saying is that human chromosome two formed when chimp chromosomes 12 and 13 were fused together, okay? So they joined, two okay. ape chromosomes joined to form human chromosome two. That is a, a, a pretty well-established belief in um, evolutionary biology. Well, it looks like it's kind of explaining why it it's like that, right? In in this paragraph here, the humans have 46 chromosomes. It's saying, thus, the fusion must have occurred after sublimeric sequences present at the end of the ancestral fusion partners have already duplicated. Okay, now, least... now what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about, we start with ape population zero. Okay. Ape population zero consists of these ancestral apes that become chimps and humans. Okay. I'm just trying to keep this as simple as possible. It's a thought experiment. It's trying to philosophically apply evolutionary biology to come up with how, with a progression of a series of steps, a human could evolve from an ape. Okay. With me? Yep. All right. So we start with ape population zero, and that is the old world apes that all have 48 chromosomes. Part of that population, a breeding population, breaks off and separates, and some physical boundaries come into play, mountains or desert or what have you. But there is a physical boundary that prohibits ape population one from interbreeding with ape population zero. So ape population zero is basically a control population, and ape population one is what's going to be our evolving population. So. Okay. These separated apes begin to interbreed and produce offspring, and the offspring initially all have 48 chromosomes. What do you mean by interbreed? Oh, okay, sorry. I've, no, continue. They have sex. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. When you, when you meant interbreed, I pictured, don't. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I use words yeah. sometimes. That... No, no, that that was my brain. It wasn't on you. That was that was. I was about to ask a very dumb question, and I stopped myself, and I'm glad I did. So continue. Okay. So we've got this breeding population one that is separated from breeding population zero, and they are also having offspring with 48 chromosomes. However, there is a mutation in the population where these two chromosomes merge or attach to them to each other and form one larger chromosome that will eventually become human chromosome number two okay it's it's described in all the literature in that paper that i showed you it's described as a fusion event Okay. Which means it's something that happens quickly. It doesn't happen over a very long period of time. And that's important because if you take chimp chromosomes or old ape chromosomes 12 and 13 and you break them apart and you lose any genetic information, the offspring dies. It's got to be preserved in whatever process causes the formation of hum, uh, human chromosome number two. 
and it's described in these papers as fusion. The technical term for it is a Robertsonian translocation, but the fact remains it's something that can't happen over millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. It's got to happen quick. It doesn't mean that this new population goes from being apes to humans in one step. It means that there's this new mutation that is now, it is currently a rare mutation, okay? Because it's only happened in a few of the breeding populations. And there's maybe 100, maybe there's 500 mating pairs of animals in this population. But only a few of the offspring to start have that fusion occur where HC2 has formed. Okay. okay, so it starts as a rare mutation. Perhaps it becomes more prominent over time, over many generations, so that it becomes a recessive trait. But there's no way that it can ever become a dominant trait in the trait such that every member of that population that breeds gives birth to human chromosome two offspring. The dominant genes are always going to be 48 chromosomes, and they're always going to be overriding the rare mutation. So my point is pretty simple. When you try to do the nuts and bolts of biological evolution, how do you ever get even one step in that direction without what we know from observation of dominant and recessive genes that dominant genes always wins. In human populations, um, in Scandinavian countries, blonde hair, blue eyes, very dominant. But the second you bring over somebody with brown eyes, those offspring are going to have brown eyes. It's never going to work. Evolution is an undirected process. It doesn't have any rhyme or reason. It does. It is directed, though. Natural selection is, it's not just uh, blind. That's, it has natural selection, too. So it has that as a guiding process. What, what, what is the guiding process of natural selection? Natural selection is the environment is basically like it's allele frequencies. It's, you know, you know, environmental. It's, you know, it has very much a guiding process in what happens to, you know, how animals evolve. The, you know, the, in, the environment plays a big part of it. You know, they like the basic thing. They either, uh, you know, adapt or they, they don't or the the ones that uh you know fare better in a certain environment you know those so those genes get passed on to their offsprings the ones that uh can survive you know they pass on the traits to to their kids so it's natural selection is what's guiding evolution and okay it, I, if i could interrupt you real no, quickly go ahead. um read any documentation on evolution and you will not find anything that says it, it, directed evolution is a contradiction in terms. It's a conundrum. You cannot have direction and evolution. Evolution cannot have any direction. The, you've got to be able to have negative mutations and neutral new mutations just as often or more often than you have positive mutations. If uh, there's neutrals no direction. Neutrals are the most common. It. Neutral mutations are the most common, harmful and uh, and good, quote unquote, are the most rare. You know, I'm trying to look for something about, uh, where did it go? About uh, natural selection. Oh, right here. Let's see. Um, let me try this. Uh, 
when I'm editing, this yeah. is the stuff I'm cutting out. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, um, the 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 silent time. Yes. Um, so like um, this, it says this is from Evolution Outreach. Uh, it says natural selection is one of the central mechanisms of evolutionary change and is the process responsible for the evolution of adaptive features. Uh, without the working knowledge of natural selection, it is impossible to understand how or why living things have come to exhibit their diversity and complexity. Um, anyway, I mean, it's a long paper, uh, but I mean, I that's pretty much what evolution is, is that it natural selection is the guiding process of evolution. Um, and I'll, 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 if I could just interrupt nope, here briefly, um, what you're doing is you're reading papers and you're just regurgitating what these papers say and all i'm asking you to do is think think about what is the guiding mechanism of natural selection it is two animals mating sexual reproduction it's animal instinct that you're talking about it's populations it's not animal to animal i mean it that that's evolution. Well, I tried to give you a, 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 a thought experiment where I took a population and derived it from an existing population and tried to take you through step by step the sequence of steps that would need to be a, accomplished in this new breeding population in order for evolution of a new species from an existing species to occur. And, well, and just to say natural selection, it isn't, a, it isn't a solution. It's just sex. And all sex is going to do is produce offspring. It's not going to pick offspring that's only got HC2. I mean... So when evolution happens, when you when you split, I'm, I'm trying to follow along with you here, because when you're splitting evolution, the species zero from one, like you said, it's it, the species is that zero species for many generations. It's not, you know, and then when they're over in this environment, they get separated, say, and they they become adaptive to that environment and whatever beneficial mutation happens it it either you know helps them survive or it doesn't and yeah biological organisms depend on reproduction well let, let's talk about that for a second um what would be the identifying factor in the formation of human chromosome two that gave the offspring any sort of survival advantage. Well, it maybe it didn't do anything. Okay. So it was a it was a a mutation that was neutral in the sense that the parents couldn't identify any change in the offspring. Because right. where I'm trying to get to is in the wild, if you have mutations that occur and the parent recognizes that the offspring isn't like the parent the parent tends to abandon that offspring sometimes that, even kills it that's not that's not going to happen that quickly though it's not going to it's not going to give birth to an ape and be like well this ape isn't like us it, it's they're not going to notice it because it, it's it's a, a such a long period of time because then when that ape is born it passes on to to that and then it's kids and but you know so on and so forth that gene gets passed on and those kids become you know uh for whatever reason the the dominant type of ape and you have to remember too that hum we homo sapiens aren't the only humans that have existed there have been homo neanderthal there have been homo habilis there's home i mean there we have discovered so many different types of humans now 
So just the fact that we are around is only because we're seeing it today, but there have been other populations of humans as well. Well, and I, that's what the thought experiment was trying to do. It was trying to go not necessarily from ape to homo habilis or one of the homos. Um, it was trying to just go from um, ape to Australopithecus, you know, whatever that first step in the evolutionary process is. And I only chose HC2 because I thought it would be something that would be pretty easy to understand and to right, communicate and use it. I'm just a, saying because in the article it explains why it happened, the one that you linked me. No, it doesn't really explain how it happened. It does not explain how it happened. They kind of gloss over that and they just assume that it happened. Because they've come to what they've done is they've come to the conclusion, they've looked at the chromosomes and they say HC2 is these two ape chromosomes joined together. And that's a conclusion. And then they look at evidence and try to retrofit the evidence so that they can reach that conclusion. And I say, well, if you're going to start out, you start at the beginning, and the beginning is the Big Bang. And then you do cosmic inflation and abiogenesis. And by the time you get to undirected evolution, and I'm sorry, natural selection is not a guiding process. It's just a description of how things reproduce. It's the description it's, of the guiding process. There is no guiding process. If if you're it's talking, nature, that's what it is. Nature is the guiding process. It's the environment. It's uh, it's. So you're you know, saying that that nature wanted humans to evolve? No, not at all. Then how did humans come to exist? From ancestors, and you know, from evolution of from unintelligent ancestors who could not they, speak. Right. So the the evolution of how humans began to speak, as I understand, they have it's not completely understood, but they actually, from what I understand, is they think it has a lot to do with fire. The fact that we started cooking our meats, which is why our jaw bones have diminished so much and why we have uh, wisdom teeth. Why do we have wisdom teeth if we didn't evolve? John, what are wisdom teeth for? And, you know, my answer is I don't have an answer for everything. I don't. So, know, right. I don't know. Right. I don't know so, why we have I mean, that's an, can but you I not don't admit think that, that that's not evidence for evolution? There, the fact that we it's have not evidence for evolution. You know what evidence for evolution is? It's when you can see something with your own eyes and verify that it happened. Okay, you can see your wisdom teeth, right? So why do we have? Why would you God can, you design can, us to have wisdom teeth if you we don't even need them? You can infer why wisdom teeth exist, and I'm sure if I spent some time doing research, I could probably come up with a reasonable explanation that involves that fits and conforms nicely into the planned universe philosophy. Well, the planned universe is is a comprehensive philosophy. It, it starts at the beginning and it goes all the way to you and me. Well, but let's start with what? With evolution though, with just evolution itself. Evolution says the reason why we have wisdom teeth is because our ancestors used to have bigger jaws because we used to have to chew our food differently. But as jaws gotten smaller, our brains enlarged. And we actually have evidence of this as our jaws gotten smaller and our brain size is getting bigger. And also it affected the sounds that we can start making with our with our voice in our mouths. Our, our grunt started slowly turning into oof, oof, point at that is as computer Brock. Oof, oof, uff, that's a freaking deer or something. It just slowly evolved our language evolved over time to get get more complex and, and so i think evolution perfectly explains why we have wisdom teeth do, do you not see the problem here you no. started with evolution and evolution 
is the change of an existing thing. Not from one thing to another. It's a slowly, it's just evolution. Like, the word evolution means the change of an existing thing. Well, yeah, now, but that, now you're saying you it doesn't mean word. macro evolution is true. And I agree with you. But you're saying macro evolution happens. It just it happens over such a long time period that it's not observable. Well, and what can I ask what your definition that is? Time has become your God. Can I can I ask you what your definition of, of uh, macro evolution is? It is the change from one species to another distinct species. Over so, time. Over time. But and over many generations. But if evolution is true. You are related to the horseshoe crab by time, mm -hmm. or well, whatever. I don't know if that and, was and, 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 and I, and I, 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 I listen to that and I hear that, and I think this is the this is a group, a very large percentage of the earth's population, very intelligent people believe utter and total nonsense. Well, maybe those intelligent people have a, a good reason. For, for believing that stuff, though, too. Well, because they have not put it in the context of the planned universe. They do what you do, which is jump right to evolution, say all of this evidence is so overwhelming, we can only reach this one conclusion, which is that humans evolve from apes. And when I say, if that's true, then we evolved from algae. We evolved from the earliest form of life that came from abiogenesis in everything from well, are, first are we not autotroph self? to today is the process product of sexual reproduction. Well, are we are we eukaryotes? Yes. So how could we have not so could we have not evolved from eukaryotes? Do eukaryotes have brains? Well, we do. Where you are where are you carry out? We are a very a, a eukaryote just describes a single celled organism, which, if, if my memory serves me correct, is means it has a nucleus. Um, because a prokaryote doesn't have a nucleus. Um, it's just got. It's it's a simpler organism. But everything on the planet that's more than one cell can be described as a eukaryote, if I understand it correctly. So does that mean that humans and octopus are related by sexual reproduction? Very, very I, distantly. Well, you know, I don't see the process when I look at it really close and I try to understand how we went from an old world ape to human chromosome two and Australopithecus, I can't even make that one step, Kyle. So yeah. how am I going to make the step all the way back to the first eukaryote, the first autotroph? Yeah, how am I going to get there? It's it's complicated and it's very. It's not that complicated. It's sex. It's it, sex. It, it is. It is though because it's you're talking about biological organisms that reproduce that, and you know we're talking about long unfathomable periods of time to us 60 and years is, is a long I time say, time is your god but i'm just saying with uh you know we, how we can show how quickly speciation can happen even with just dogs if you were to if somebody an alien were to come down to this world and you were to show them a wolf and you were to show them a pug do you think that they would say that those things are related no, they would be like those two dogs. Those two things are different. You're making the, the, the my argument for you're you know. making my argument for me. If Andre the Giant and Kenny Baker, the little um, miniature guy that played R two D two in Star Wars, if they're buried side by side for a million years and an anthropologist digs them up, they're going to classify those two as two different species. 
Today, we can DNA test Andre the Giant and Kenny Baker and say, nope, they're both homo sapiens. They are human beings. And so, just the same way we can identify a chimpanzee that, DNA with that, human that, DNA that shows that, that we are related. It's the okay. same now, process. Now I'm going to have to get into briefly my theory, which is unprofessional as all can be, but DNA, it's God's Lego. God can make any kind of creature out of DNA, <clears throat> but DNA cannot reconstitute itself to make any kind of creature from itself. Anytime two creatures of that are not exactly the same species procreate, they produce hybrids, and those hybrids are biological dead ends. Not necessarily, not always. You know, the ligands and uh, tigans and ligers, they they are not all necessarily sterile, but they do revert to the DNA characteristics of the mother. What about with, German with shepherds the, and wolves? They can they can breed together. It's not different, and, and they're and they're but, fertile, and those offspring are fertile. They're the dogs can breed with other wolves it just depends on how by far my, away by my classification system the john leonard classification system <laughs> dogs and wolves <laughs> are the same basic creature <laughs> but but you can see how they're different though right i mean it's just like humans and apes with the homology that they we look... don't call we don't call asians different species well no because they if you were to put take everything off to of an Asian down to the skeletal and you were to put me next to it, you, they look, I mean, just that I'm taller, but you, they look human, but you can, it's the same thing, the same thing with, the ball, with the, say, if you dig up a wolf and a dog skeleton, you're going to notice the similarities a lot faster than you notice the differences. The same with, same with chimps. We share the same, the same types of bones in our arms and our feet they, they, it's the same thing. It's just that dogs are, you know, the wolf, they're wolves. And then there's the, like a, you know, a German shepherd. They would have the same type of bones as they do. John, why do, why do dogs have dew claws up here? What, what's this little dew claw they have up here for if they didn't evolve? Why do, how why do, do emus do have little claws on the evolution. end of their wings? How do dew claws prove evolution? Because they used to be plantigrade instead of on their toes like they are now. They and they evolved to be on their toes because it made them faster, but they used to be plantigrade more on their the you know, they used to be more flat footed like that. So the, the dew claw used to be their their almost their toe. But now because they're they run on their toes, it became up here and it's become uh what's the word? <coughs> Uh, let's say diminished. It's become like I'm the words uh, out of my brain right now, but uh, it's just leftover. You know, it's you know it doesn't have the same function anymore. It's just useless. The same thing with emus. If you were to look at an emu's wing, it has a tiny little claw at the end of it. It's useless. It does nothing. It doesn't hurt anybody. They can't use it as defense. But it's there. Why would an emu have a little claw at the end of its wing if it can't do anything with it? Evolution explains why that claw is there. ID just doesn't. It just says that everything was designed from, I mean, just from a singular bird, and then it evolved to that. But evolution says that that emu has, you know, dinosaur. Uh, ancestors that used to be able to use that claw, but over time it's di it diminished to nothing. You know, over generations of generations, it, the claw had lost its use. It didn't need anything. So the environment, you know, uh, whatever the environment they were in, they didn't need the claw anymore. It became more efficient to be a better runner or to have, you know, those wings. For whatever reason, they lost the use of it, but it's still there. It's just, it's nothing. Same with the legs and whales. 
I'm glad that you mentioned that because I was I, <laughs> I knew it. The, the stigial organs in whales. I mean, people they they look at evidence and they come up with an interpretation that fits their worldview. Evolutionary biologists they look at the whale and they see these bones in the whales and they say, ah. They're vestigial legs. The whales used to have legs. That was the word I was looking for. And and the legs went away, but the bones stayed in there. But then you read other evolutionary biologists, and I don't remember whether it's in the males, it supports the phallus during the sexual mating process, or if it's in the females only, and it's for the birthing process. But from what I've read, only one of the two genders in males, uh, I mean, in, in whales, not males, um, one of the two genders, and we can say that there are only two genders in whales. <laughs> um, but um, I'm with you on all that, John. I, I know that. That's why we've been friends for so long. Yep. But um Whatever it is, if it's only in male whales or if it's only in female whales, these bones apparently do not exist in both genders. So that the, tells the me legs that, they serve, that, bone. that they serve a function. They serve a purpose. They may not serve it all the time, but they serve it at some point. Right. And it that's could what be that those little me. emu dew claws, the, it may be Nobody's ever seen them used in any way, but they may have some function. And what I would say to you is in the science, in the scientific method, the most powerful tool in the toolbox is observation. If you can see it with your own eyes, you know, that's what happened. If well, you don't see it with your own eyes, you can infer, and you may infer correctly, but you don't have eyewitness firsthand knowledge like you do if you see something. And in the book, I, I talked about the sailing stones of racetrack playa. And that, to me, was an argument against ev um, biological evolution because what it says is, if you can't see something with your own eyes, if the scientist had not been out on racetrack playa and seen with their own eyes what was actually moving those stones, they wouldn't have known. They still wouldn't know. But they were lucky. They were there when the stones were moving, and they saw it. They witnessed it. They recorded it. There's no doubt what causes those stones to move now. Right. But before... I've observation came into play it was only speculation and it's important to know that they were all wrong in what they were guessing was causing it yeah um i think uh i mean obviously we don't have eyewitnesses to every crime that's committed we have to infer with evidence and whatever and you know an eyewitness testimony isn't even the greatest uh proof in my opinion too if eyewitness testimony was the best proof ever then we wouldn't need in courts you know eyewitness testimony would be the the you know greatest evidence you could possibly have it's a piece of evidence but it's not the whole thing um i no, think it, that it's a you know, when you're looking at when you're looking at the past all you can do is look at the like when you're looking at a car wreck you can only you don't you weren't there to see the car wreck but you see a car in the ditch, you see tires everywhere, you see a guy on fire running down the street, you see evidence that a car accident happened, and that's the same thing that I, I think uh, scientists are looking at. And, you know, vestigial does not, doesn't necessarily mean it's completely functionless, it just means that it lost its original function to what it was even that claw sure maybe there's something that they use it for now that we don't know about but its original function of being a defense main defense is gone it's just used for different things and evolution really it predicts vestigial uh organs and that's something that teeth are in us uh you know men have nipples because for whatever reason i don't know why but, you know, it's 
doesn't mean vestigial doesn't mean functionless. It just means it lost its original function. That's not a an invalid point. Um, I hope you know I'm having a really great time doing this. I've been like I am too. I just looked at the <laughs> clock and saw that we've been going almost two hours. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I got to take my wife bowling too. So uh, we can wrap it up here, and I'm I'm more than happy to to do another chat sometime. Yeah, so I'd love to have you on again, and yep. uh, I really enjoyed this. I think it went probably a lot better than uh, that I had hoped. Yeah, uh, I, I had a great time. Uh, the, the maiden voice something. there, and and yeah, it was a it was a good conversation. So uh, I'll thank you now and say goodbye. And, yeah, thank you, John. Uh, we'll do this again. Cool. All we'll right. talk to you soon. All right. Bye.